Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, so there's good news and there's bad news. On the good side, um, at McKinsey's last count, 26% of global total AUM incorporated ESG in one way or another. Um, I think it's safe to assume probably the majority of you in here fall within that 26%, so well done, you're among the enlightened quarter. Um, the bad news is, and you know, perhaps we should call it a challenge instead, is that if we're going to avoid the volatility and the value destruction that would be inherent in a disorderly transition, then we've got 74% more work to do. What we thought we would do this afternoon is put together a panel of people to discuss how we can bring more of the skeptics into the fold. Um, so on our panel, we have uh, Rick Davis, who is a partner with Pegasus Capital Advisors. We have Rodrigo Garcia, who is Deputy State Treasurer and Chief Investment Officer at the Illinois State Treasury. We have Ben Yeo, Senior Portfolio Manager, RBC Global Asset Management. Lisa Wall, who is CEO of US SIF. And Dave Zellner, who is Chief Investment Officer. Um, Rodrigo, if I could pick on you first. Um, the Illinois State US Treasury is the first in the country to sign up to the PRI, and I believe it was quite a recent process. Could you just talk us through your journey and what your main learnings were from having to convince your colleague that that was a worthy endeavor? Sure, so, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Rodrigo here, pleasure to be here. So we have been the first US Treasury, or the first Treasury in the US that has signed up for the principles of responsible investment. Now, this is a journey that began really early in 2015 uh, under a new administration where we knew that there was a number of factors that were impacting the bottom line and we wanted to begin to integrate those. But as part of that journey, and uh, which culminated uh, into us being the first treasury, I could tell you, and some of this we'll talk about here this afternoon, was some of the barriers, some of the pitfalls, some of the noise that exi existed, some of the skepticism that existed out there in terms of being able to integrate some of these factors. And a lot of it is on communication and language, but some of it is real around the, the data itself as well. Uh, but I could tell you that it was a three-year journey, and for us, really, this is just the beginning and another point as we move forward. Uh, what, was the, what was the tipping point then? You mentioned language. Was there a change in approach that you had to go through to bring people on side? Yeah, so it's a really a question of values-driven to value-driven. So it's one of, are we incorporating uh, values that, that, that don't necessarily have an impact to the value-driven approach, which is an easier approach to bring on folks because you know, many folks are like, oh, why are you integrating uh, these type of factors? That's some kind of liberal social agenda. And then you would point to them about you know, some of the, you know, just being able to personify in it. What, happened, what is the impact of, say, rising sea waves on insurance companies? What is the impact of stranded assets for oil companies in terms of uh, those oil rigs out in the, on the Gulf of Mexico? What is the, the impact of, ri of rising energy bills on those real estate investments trusts? And, it, and once you were able to personify it, once you were able to, uh, to connect it to how some of these factors are actually impacting the bottom line, then at that point, it was, it was, that tip one point was hit, and, at that, and, and then it was full steam ahead from there. Okay, so essentially a, a communication issue around actually Part demonstrating it, yeah. the economic the link. Point. Correct. Okay. Um, Dave, as an asset owner, is that a, an experience you share? Uh, absolutely. We, you know, we believe that uh, climate change is real and that there is an opportunity for an, from an investment perspective to make investments that are in the best interest of our participants and that will help mitigate the in impacts of climate change. Our journey has been one where we've had to convince folks, you know, the topic is convincing the skeptics, that there are risks and opportunities associated with climate change. And when you strictly use the word climate change, there are people that are just skeptical that, oh, it's like I think Rodrigo said, it's political. This is all a political issue. And to the extent that we can explain that no, there are, as Rigo again indicated, that there are risks to insurance companies from uh, hurricanes and other type of events that we're seeing on the East Coast this week, and that there are opportunities through power management and renewable energy as the price of renewable energy goes down. 
Once they realize that there's an economic benefit to paying attention to environmental and social governance issues, that that's a way to convince the skeptics that there's an opportunity for our participants from a fiduciary perspective uh, to add value in our portfolios. Ben, what's your experience as a portfolio manager? Yeah, I'd agree. I, uh, when I'm convincing skeptics, I have a thing a friend said, I have to translate from, massive apologies here, from old white man language <laughs> into another kind of language they kind of understand. So uh, help to actually, there's a recent book, um, Capitalism Without Capital, showing that the majority of value in companies today is in their intangible assets. And a lot of those intangible assets, if you translate it, falls into ESG headings, human capital, environmental capital, your relationship with your regulators and things. So explaining them into them terms that they understand, it's like intangible, so like these are things which are missing off reporting accounts, missing off the balance sheet. But we know that if you treat these things badly or well, they come to impact your company. And then give them an example like um, employee satisfaction or employee turnover. You'd say, would you prefer to be in a company with high employee turnover or low employee turnover? Well, for a mainstream analyst, that comes in, well, that's just a material business factor, right? And then it says, well, that also happens to fall under the S in ESG. So that kind of translation into it where you go, look, these are material business factors, and then show and give them examples of where it's either minimizing the risk in things or actually showing them there's opportunity and value in a kind of language that they understand, that kind of inclusive language, I find really helps. I would add to that, to that intangible piece, you know, when you're talking about the S&P 500 assets, and I tell this when I talk to skeptics, is 1975, approximately 17% were intangible. And as of 2015, 84% of the S&P 500's assets are intangible. And so the, the issues that are impacting their share price and the value of that company is very much tied to some of these factors that we allude to. The brand value, the patents, the intellectual capital, all those pieces are impacted today, and being able to relay that, as um, my fellow colleague here is uh, alluding to, is key in those conversations. And if you're not doing it, I mean, it just doesn't seem very clever. It's a toolbox you need to use, mm -hmm. particularly if the majority of value is in these type of ESG type factors. And that kind of information is, is inefficient. It's hard to get hold of. You know, we have this question about the data and things. Well, actually, inefficient data should be magic to portfolio managers' ears because if it's a commoditized piece of data, if everyone knows it, there's less value in it. If it's data that you know is valuable, should be there and should be assessed, then you're going to potentially make a lot of money out of it. Mm -hmm. And yet we hear um, from sessions this morning, for example, that portfolio managers are not actually using the data that they have in their toolkit when it comes to reflecting that in their valuations of companies. What's the disconnect there, and how do we solve that? I don't know if you have a view, Rick. Well, I, I think one of the disconnects is, is uniformity, right? I mean, the data that gets generated by many different uh, portfolio managers may be desperate in how it's accumulated and how it's analyzed and how it's presented. I know in our own case, uh, we've just recently implemented across our portfolio uh, just under 25 companies an ESG regiment where we're collecting financial data at the portfolio company level, We've automated that in order to aggregate up, in order to be able to deliver to our LPs, you know, a systematic approach to analysis on how we grade ESG data coming out of our portfolio. I would dare say that is going to be completely different than, you know, other approaches that are taken uh, with the same LPs. And so they're going to look at our data and say, well, how come they have the granularity, you know, at the portfolio company level uh, inside, you know, the company's generation, let's say, of HO2. Uh, CO2 or water or even on the social side, you know, are impacting communities around uh, the world where our portfolio companies reside. And, and I think that uniformity or lack thereof uh, is just one of the growth um, um, uh, issues related to specifically ESG analysis. So uh, it's more work for portfolio um, uh, managers to do that, but it's also more work for the LPs to be able to do that analysis. It's not just a typical spreadsheet uh, that are pretty uniform at the LP level that they're looking at on performance. And so I do think one thing uh, that I would say is that, 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 that we're still very much in a growth phase of all of this, right? I mean, we started um, uh, a sustainability-only portfolio 10 years ago, and when we went around to raise money for that fund, uh, there were very few people who had a focus on ESG or sustainability, right? It, it, we heard about impact, but we're supposed to give up 
return for impact. And we weren't going to give up return. So we were a lonely voice in that atmosphere. Um, today, uh, as we've just seen, big companies like TPG are raising billions of dollars in this space. There's more uh, uh, excitement about it. You look at just San Francisco this week with the global conference going on just across the park uh, with leaders from all over the world who are promoting the, the exponential increase in investment and work being done around ESG, responsible investment, sustainability, impact. I mean, these are the kinds of things that create great public self-awareness, creates a lot of energy within the industry, and then puts a lot of pressure on the industry to uh, create standards, like what you've done at, at, at PRI, uh, for, the, for the people like us, asset managers and, and LPs and others, to, to be able to adhere to. So I think, I think that it's, it's a multiplier effect, right? What we've accomplished today is to create a multiple of activity in this space, which will then exponentially increase over the next few years. We've seen lots of graphs that show that when you get adaption or adoption, um, you can really create a multiple effect uh, throughout an industry, and I think ours is just going through that now. You know, I might like to add regarding the data. You know, a lot of, we have a lot of data currently that are, is taken into consideration. To a certain extent, someone can say that the data is discounted in the market. What we're interested in, where we think the opportunity is, is the journey a company is going to take. So we're hoping that our managers will evaluate companies and try to assess, okay, this is where a company is today in terms of data, but where will it be five, ten years from now? And dig in, talk to management, try to get an understanding of the journey that company is going to be taking. Uh, that's where we think the opportunity is. So, Emma, it seems to me, though, that we're, we're already at the part where we're looking at data that's related to ESG, and I mm -hmm. think a big part of convincing the skeptics is starts way before then, which is sort of how do we deal, first of all, in the U.S., with fundamental financial illiteracy. So that's a major issue. Most people don't understand if they have a retirement account, what's in it, what kind of asset classes are there. We have uh, an inability to understand... Uh, what sustainable investment is for the average, the average investor. And so we have to deal with, with those sorts of issues first. I think uh, there's a lot of conversation oftentimes that we use too many terms for the field, green investing, sustainable, responsible impact. I really think that's not what we should be having the conversation about. I think we should be having a conversation about using investment tools, utilizing ESG criteria in order to have better investments and to have a positive impact on the world. If we talk about mission, if we talk about the why instead of the what, we have a very different conversation. And I feel that we've siloed ourselves. I do impact investing. I do private equity. I do fixed income. I'm really a better impact investor. I make more impact. That is the wrong conversation. The right conversation is why are we doing this? What are the stories about why we're doing this and how we can do this across all asset classes? That's how we're going to bring more people into it. And on that, I want to say I think we're really bad storytellers, okay? In addition to having financial language that is obfuscating at best, and I say this as someone who runs a field building institution, so I don't work uh, for an asset manager, an asset owner, we don't tell the stories. We have great stories in this community. Uh, I was preparing to come today and I thought, I want to find a shareholder story that I think would get any investor to want to be part of this. So in 2016, our Juna Capital began with 10 proposals on closing the gender pay gap at 10 tech companies. They had pretty good votes, over 10%, over the 3% that you need at the SEC in order to resubmit the next year. But they were also able to withdraw agreements at several companies because they agreed to either close that gender gap immediately or in the near future. In 2018, more than 30 proposals by Arjuna, the New York Pension Fund, and other investors were sent to companies with similar success. We all know, everybody in this room, that there's increasing interest in gender lens investing, right? We've all heard that. Who wouldn't want to hear this story? So why aren't we telling these stories? Why aren't we talking to people in a language from an, a highly sophisticated investor to a very unsophisticated investor? This is how we are going to convince people to come to us, is to tell them why they should. So I just want to make that really clear because mm -hmm. if we get lost in kind of a data conversation, what happens once you get into 
the investment process, we forget that we haven't brought those investors with us yet. You know, we, yeah. have this, uh, and we have this experience at our organization. We'll go out and we'll make presentations to our stakeholders and we'll tell the stories yeah. that Lisa talks about. We'll tell the impact that we're having through our affordable housing program. We'll tell about the changes that we've been able to make with companies by sitting down and engaging with our partners. And after the meeting, it's not uncommon for someone, one of our stakeholders, to come up to me and say, I had no idea. Right. that my pension fund was involved in this type of activity. Yeah. So how do we improve that flow of information? I mean, how, how instrumental is the press, for example, in this? Well, I, I would say that, that this is one of the echo chambers we've got to occupy space in, right? I mean, we are all talking about an industry that talks to each other on a pretty regular basis. There's good communication across. We have our same jargon. But when we now try to explain to the public any of this, uh, and financial liter literacy is, an, is a major point, but the media doesn't oh, understand any absolutely. of this, right? And whether it's the business media, the political media, the social media, um, these are all huge outlets that have never spent time or resources of their own to dig in. I mean, Bloomberg has probably invested as much in trying to analyze uh, these trends uh, around uh, sustainability and impact and ESG than any other outlet, but, but but this has to be ubiquitous. It has to be in every media outlet, in every corner of the world, and there are lots of wonderful stories to tell, regardless of whether there are communities that are dealing with you know, uh, climate impact, uh, that are finding solutions that actually help uh, uh, create diversity and economic opportunity, or whether it's you know, economic uh, engines like businesses that are gravitating toward these kinds of approaches. But, but it's gonna be incumbent upon everybody to lean in, right? We can't just talk to ourselves. You know, we've got to go out and we've got to stick a stake in the ground and say the media uh, ought to know this. And and I'd say our political leaders need this message too. Um, I I uh, was in the Reagan administration in the White House running domestic policy when we first started talking about climate issues, and that was before most of everybody, maybe everybody in this audience, was born. And uh, and and it was just the very beginning of that debate by 2000 or by 1990 we had our first white house conference on global climate change the very first one that wasn't that long ago but the message didn't get around to the elected leaders now you have an attitude i i walked over to the gcast conference today and was accosted by angry protesters screaming no cap and trade um i mean who ever heard of a protester screaming no cap and trade i mean they don't even know what it is <laughs> Um, and so, so I think we've got a, an environment where, you know, we've got to show up at town halls. We've got to go see our members of Congress. We've got to decide when we're voting in a mayor's race whether or not we think climate has a difference or, or opportunity to uh, make change. And I think those are all things that have to be stacked on top of each other uh, in order to ultimately change the culture and the attitude. Mm -hmm. So they are what I would call five key stakeholder groups here. That, because who are the skeptics, right? You're asking, well, who are these skeptics that we're to, alluding to? Well, they're found across a multitude of various stakeholders. You have asset managers, you have investment consultants, you have the trustees slash asset owners, you have companies themselves, and then you have the, invest, uh, the ultimate beneficiary, whether it's uh, in a DC plan or in a DB plan. And so they all have various views and perceptions of what it means to be ESG or sustainable or any of the other uh, words that we tend to use. And so each of them is gonna have their own challenges and their own barriers to being able to accomplish this. For example, I'll give you just two key ones. You know, in, in a world where uh, uh, DC assets or those that are in 401ks and IRAs are now larger than DB assets, those are in pension plans, it is key to understand who, who is the demo, uh, the, uh, some of the demographics because these are individuals that are also making decisions, both at the plant sponsor for when they're designing target date funds, given that they have become by far the, the, the easy fix uh, for many investors, to the way that, uh, the, say, the millennial generation, who is gonna be 75% of the global workforce by 2025, and 90% of millennials don't care about profits only, they care about many other things. So how are we designing some of those plans to accommodate the new workforce? Or, for example, we're talking about companies. I sat down uh, for, uh, for lunch with a CEO of a Fortune 500 company uh, a few months ago in Chicago, 
and we were talking about all the changes he's doing uh, to really push the envelope. But one of the key questions he had to me is like, but yet when I'm jumping on to my earnings call and telling them about all these great changes, do you think they ask me about the number of women and minorities on my board? Do you think they're asking me about the sustainable strategies that I'm incorporating uh, in this particular uh, division of the company? No, they, don't, they ask me many other things except those things that I'm addressing. So then how do we, we then as asset owners begin to move that needle forward so when they are jumping on those earnings cars or, though, or, or we have analysts, the street analysts making buy and sell ratings and putting price uh, targets, long-term price targets at certain companies that they're incorporating some of this information because that's what some of these executive teams are looking at uh, as they're trying to wade through the, uh, through the information of data and making it more readily available to investors. And then obviously there's many other things related to some of the other stakeholders, but just wanted to bring that point up. So when I think in all of the stakeholder groups, what could be very important is for, you know, Dave, you just talked about telling the stories and having folks that I never knew. You need to tell those more broadly because I know when, when I work with potential members who say, we really want to add ESG to our foundation or we really want to become an advisor who knows how to do this, what they often want to do is talk to their comrade in the foundation world or another advisor or another asset manager because that makes it less scary to do it. And I feel like we as a community, leadership of asset management firms, asset owners, you need to be speaking out on why you did this. Mm -hmm. why you incorporated ESG, either as part of your investment portfolio, as all of it, and explain why it's not scary to do. We've put out some roadmaps in the last several months, one for advisors, one for asset managers, asset owners next, because we wanted to take people down the walk. This is how you start, this is where you can end, but you can keep going. And I think to hear from people who have successfully done this, a, a state pension plan, a private pension plan, incredibly impactful and so I think if we tell those stories and invite people to ask us questions about the how and the why we start to get rid of that skepticism because we create a different reality yeah. picking up on that silo point I, I do really think we need to break out of that yeah. silo I mean look at us all here today I mean it's kind of like hands up anyone here in the room who would consider themselves a mainstream portfolio manager or risk taker or something like that I'm not seeing very many hands up there. We're, we're not very inclusive ourselves. We're not telling these stories to the people who need to hear them. I mean, I, I have an example of where, you know, you had a mainstream mining analyst, went to an ESG type event, came back converted because a lot of it makes sense. If you can get them in the room, if we can talk to them, talk to them about our story, talk to them about why it's there. But if they're not in the room, if they're not here, we, we end up in this echo chamber where we're really not reaching out perhaps as well as we think we are. And how much of that comes down to better articulation of the values and the desires by the asset owners? Because that's the more natural relationship rather than necessarily getting them to come into this room. And then subsequently measuring that and going back to that old adage that what gets measured gets managed. How much is that going to be what convinces the portfolio managers is really the, you know, the push from their own clients in clear articulation? Well, asset owners definitely have a big role to pay, and I, I, think, I think they are. And that transmission, though, then into the asset managers who are, who are going to be listening. You know, we talked about the investment chain and the ecosystem and growing that pie, but we really, really need to, to move out and keep speaking that story. Rodrigo, a minute ago you mentioned another group, which is the consultants. Um, one of the complaints that, that I've heard quite a lot as, as a journalist over the years is that the consultants haven't kept up pace with, this, uh, with this, this issue of sustainability. What's your experience there? Do you think they are good enough? Do you think they still have work to do? Oh, they definitely have a lot of room <laughs> yeah. to grow. Yeah, I've been, I, uh, you know, I am a, an asset owner who is one who likes to take the lead. But I could tell you, there are many asset owners. Oh, my investment consultant told me this. My investment consultant uh, told me this. You know, at the end of the day, the, who is the fiduciary? Are they the fiduciary or are you the fiduciary? If they are the fiduciary, you, I, I hope that you're out doing outsourced CIO service and extend to them the legal uh, risk as well. But if you are the fiduciary, you are making the determination. If you do not like their particular uh, opinion or analysis, then you just have to justify why, and you documented why. 
But many folks, they just defer to their investment consultants. And unfortunately, uh, 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 the, pro the progress has been slower than I would like. With that being said, though, there are a number, though, who have taken very proactive roles uh, in the world uh, of sustainability and have moved to begin to include some of that. And some of that has just been because of the work the CFA Society has done overall. Mm -hmm. I know there was uh, conversations about that already uh, here earlier in this conference. But, uh, and then others who are not coming along, the way that I talk when I uh, talk to my fellow CIOs across the U.S. is either you drag them along or you kick them out the door and you find someone else. At the end of the day, it's, they work for us, not the other way around. I so, would say, though, yes. that one of the issues that the consultants probably have to deal with is the different interests that the mm -hmm. asset managers and the asset owners have on this, right? Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many pension funds that I've been to over the last 10 years who say, look, we just want to talk about the returns. You know, it's, we've talked about that a little bit before. And if they're saying that to us, they're saying it to their consultants. And if their consultants are saying that, then they're saying, well, why do we want to invest in a special basket for the sustainability or the ESG or the, you know, responsible investing if, if, if when we get to the pension funds who are our clients, they're going to say, look, that's great stuff, but, you know, what we want to know is are they in the first quartile and what kind of returns have they done over the last 10 years? Um, I, I think it's everybody's game, right? I think uh, funds can get consultants to do the right thing if it's their priority to tell them to do it. Uh, they just reflect the views of their clients. Um, you know, at the end of the day, as you spoke, um, it's really down to the person who's generating the wealth, the worker, you know, and we're in, a, we're in a significant demographic change where we have 100 million millennials who think differently about how their money should be put to work than probably we did when we invested. And, uh, and that will drive change. Uh, I hate to leave it to demographics, but it's certainly going to be one of the best friends we have as we expand our investment capability in this area. And so uh, I think that's part of the culture change, right, is, is if people decide they want products that give them uh, access to these kinds of ESG opportunities or whatnot, and, and, and then um, pension funds and other big managers allow that to happen, and then the consultants will get the message and say, wow, if this is where the money's flowing, that's where we're flowing, they'll become more sophisticated and, and start recruiting people you know, out of rooms like this. You know, Emma, there really needs to be a paradigm shift in the asset owner market. You know, Rick talked about the fact that a client will ask the consultant about the performance of the manager and how much alpha they added over a certain period of time. And one of my mantras is we spend too much time focusing on alpha, right. and not enough time focusing on beta. Mm -hmm. To the extent that we can collectively shift the markets through our engagement activities in convincing others to improve their footprint, their carbon footprint, to improve their human resource management, to improve other activities that have an impact from an environmental social governance perspective. We can do what Fiona talked about yesterday, which is help bring about a more prosperous world. It's not about, we shouldn't be focusing on that scarce resource of alpha, which is negative when you consider the impact of transaction costs but make a realization that we can change the markets if collectively we act together. It's an interesting point that, particularly in the context of uh, the shift we see towards passive and the arguments we hear from a lot of passive managers about um, you know, simply not having the resources to go out there and, and engage properly. Um, how valid is that, that argument, do you think, Ben? Well, I guess there's different levels of stewardship here, and I do think stewardship is uh, a reasonable critique of that asset management industry over the last uh, decade or so. Because in some of the uh, passive ones, you might have teams of 30, 60, but they're dealing with 17,000 securities or the like. So they'll have to deal mainly with outliers in the bottom decile, and there's questions about how they deal with it systematically. You know, a team like mine, where there's 10 of us looking at 35 companies, you get a very different level of, of stewardship and things like that. And I, I was challenged actually by a friend saying that actually part of it is we should preach less and simply just lead and do these things. And he's, he was saying, well, you know, Apple didn't tell Nokia how to build a phone. They just did a better way. And with a lot of that better way and things, they will, they will follow. I think there is a reasonable argument as to, well, how do we do this stewardship across a beta and across that? And I think two of the key points there will be collaboration, where I think we're still relatively early in that journey, and also better transparency so that our stakeholders can see and tell what we're doing or what we're trying to do on their behalf, and we can work across the system uh, to do more collaboration on these important topics. Do you think asset owners are good enough at holding 
asset managers to account on their stewardship and actually measuring the impact of their stewardship over time? Or is that another area to work on? Don't want to upset any of my asset owner friends there. <laughs> I think there's a range. Um, and I think the ship is moving in the same direction. And I think those who are maybe uh, faster boats in that flotilla have perhaps something to help those who want to be floating down that river and perhaps who are not as fast. I do think asset owners can hold some of their fund managers to better account, whether passive or active. And in that conversation with leading that, then we can get this improvement um, in the market that we all see. So yes, I do think at the asset owner chain there is more to be done, but there are some very great leading lights carrying people forward along mm -hmm. that journey. And how do we convince the asset owners to work together more closely, more collaboratively on, on engagement? Because particularly if you look at you know, the scale of companies that we're talking about, it's not possible for any one asset manager or any one asset owner to reach that full universe of investees. So it requires a more collaborative approach. How do we, um, how do we convince them to take that mantle up? David, if you... Uh, yeah, I, that's, that's a tough one because I've been on a journey with my fellow religious investors over the last 20-some-odd years, and it's been a slow journey. You know, I can remember when I first started interacting with the group that I'd start talking about it. Well, we didn't have ESG at the time, but I would start talking about engagement and those type of activities, and the eyes would roll, and the, there'd be yawning. And you know, now I get the phone call. So Dave, I remember five years ago, you were telling me about a certain activity. Tell me more about that, because I'm getting interest from our, our stakeholders. And, and so that's where it's going to come from. It's their stakeholders are asking them, gee, I hear that the Methodists are doing such and such. What are you doing in that area? And that's when they start getting religion to, uh, <laughs> to move forward in terms of... You're the only one who can use that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, one of the, I think one of the issues around how do, you, uh, how, how do you convince the skeptics is straight out demand, right? Demand for these products and services. So in the last 10 years, there has been a sea change. Um, I can tell you in our own membership, certainly in PRI's membership and others, to much bigger firms, much more conventional firms who have taken on some aspect of sustainable, responsible investing. Why did they do that? Okay, maybe they read all the research and they saw that it was a better way to invest or that it would actually help you do two things at once, but maybe it was because they have clients who said, you can do this or I go and I find another firm or another advisor or another consultant. And, um, you know, I think part of what our work is is to be demand drivers, you know, to be writing the stories in the media, to be talking to journalists who are going to write the stories about why this is a better way to invest. You know, millennials are picking up the robo-advisors. That's going to fundamentally change the way sustainable investment is done and all investing is done going forward because they look at this and go, I can't find an advisor doing sustainable investment, and so I'm going to go to a robo-advisor that's got a sustainable investment option. And so demand is really going to be the number one way we convince skeptics because money talks. Yeah. And so if we want more, if we want the skepticism to go away or to hide itself, then we increase the demand on those firms because they're going to give people what they want ultimately. And so part of that has to get to education as well of financial professionals. And so you've got courses like PRI's Academy, US CIF has a course. We're just about to launch a, the first designation on sustainable investment with the College for Financial Planning for advisors. And I think over the next five years, that will be a game changer because you now have advisors who will have an official designation that says they are specialists in that. Well, they have clients, and those clients are going to get those options, which means it will go all the way up the food chain of investment. And so we need to be part of the demand drivers because skepticism goes away really quickly when your client's going to walk out the door. True. So, um, yeah. I think the same thing happens when, the, um, when policy shifts and people find themselves on the wrong side of that. Um, how do we, and we've touched on policy, but it would be good just to, to return to that a little bit. How do we go about convincing the skeptics in, in politics? And I, I think particularly, you know, here we are in the US, it's a market where the policy landscape is perhaps a little behind the rest of the world. How do we address that change within the White House and with other sort of, um, political forums to, to really get them to provide the stick, if you like, not just the carrot? Well, um, 
I, I don't have to explain the U.S. policy context to most of you. I think you're probably aware of it at this moment. Um, you know, I think the reality is that, you know, Al Gore was really clear yesterday, engage with policy, engage with policymakers. How many of you in this room have gone to your respective houses of parliament or Congress at any point to talk about the work that you do? Can you put your hands up? Okay, that's not a lot of people. It's maybe a fifth. So how many of you are going to go do it because you've never done it before, before you come back here next year? Let's see those hands. Okay, see, t like 10 hands went up. So how are we going to influence policymakers if we're not influencing them? I can go up there, my, my policy director goes up there to the Hill and to the SEC, but boy, if all of you came with me and you spoke about what you do, especially you as a Republican or a former Republican maybe, um, you know, to some Republican offices. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm a Teddy Roosevelt Republican. <laughs> so really a former Republican. Um, you know, that stuff matters. And so using our voice as investors to, one, tell policymakers what we do. Because here, here's the right. real truth. They don't know what we do. Most yeah. policymakers don't understand the investment process either. And so, but once they hear about this, they're interested. The federal retirement program is a great, a great example. We've been working with them for eight years to get a sustainable investment option. It's the largest retirement program in the country. Lots of people go to work for the federal government because they want to make a change at the Department of Labor, the Department of State. We still don't have a sustainable investment option. That's one thing that's, it, it's moving along, but it's moving along slowly. That's a really important way for governments to play a role in this, is to offer sustainable investment options in their plans. Mm -hmm. But consistently going to regulators and policymakers and your legislative bodies is incredibly important because guess what? They start to see you as an expert and they call you when they're writing legislation and they want your input on bills. And tomorrow, uh, a piece of legislation is dropping in the Senate. I can't talk about it right now, but you know, we have, a, we have a, 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 a note in there about why we're supportive of it because it directly, directly goes to things that sustainable investors care about. And they call us because we go up there even though it's slogging work and very basic on many, many days, you reap rewards going forward because they want to know what we think mm -hmm. as sustainable and responsible investors. It is worth the investment, but we have to make it. I, I think it is slowly happening also if you look around the world. Um, and you can see this partly in stewardship codes, how they're being updated, uh, UK stewardship code, but you have ones in Japan and around the yep. world, uh, and they're moving in that direction. You've got work in Europe on the H leg. Road, yep. Uh, you had the UK with the Department of Work yeah. and Pensions coming through. So I think it is being recognized and we have to continue to push on that input into the steward code, stewardship codes or corporate governance codes, your respective countries um, and their regulators and things, and input into that because then you do make a difference and you be heard. And then when it's in there, pension trustees and the like go, oh, okay. ESG or sustainability or something like that, that then that flows through right. and then that can bring the investment consultants along because they have to advise on that. So it is, an, it is an important lever. I think it is beginning to be recognized and if you haven't reached out to the respective uh, people in your, in your countries on that, uh, I think it's something that we should all be doing. But, but um, high legs so the high level expert group in, in Europe, which is now moving forward with this, that's a, that was a very big time commitment from the folks who engaged in that, the investors and the field building institutions, but their voices were heard and they had a, an opportunity to shape that. So I'm saying, you know, it is worth the time to, to be, become an expert on how you can affect the policy process because then you can actually change the game. Yeah, I think the U.S. is one of the very few places where uh, this kind of policy discussion has become partisan, right? I mean, in Britain, uh, you can't find a whole lot of difference between the liberals and the conservatives on environmental policy or on things like investment policy related to sustainability. It, administrations change, but those policies stay pretty close to the same. Uh, somehow, over the last 30 years, we got off the tracks you know, here in the United States and it became a partisan issue. And I would say um, I've been encouraged lately because uh, a number of my friends uh, have been speaking up to me about uh, things that are happening in their home states. And it goes along with this idea of you've got to have a good story to tell. Uh, uh, John Thune, you know, a conservative Republican uh, from a fracking state, and uh, Rob Portman, another conservative Republican from a fracking state, both are out bragging about the amount of deployment of renewable energy in their states. Uh, it's actually 
uh, the largest power generation increase in the last 10 years have come out of renewables. It's not come out of gas, it's not come out of fracking. Because in those states, because of peculiarities of their economy, uh, uh, renewables are actually competitive financially uh, with, uh, with frack and uh, with gas, and, and it has a story to tell about why it's healthier for the environment and the communities that they serve. They like that. All of a sudden, two guys who haven't spent 10 minutes worrying about this issue for the last 20 years are out there bragging about the fact that they've got renewable energy in their states. So as these things become more confident and, 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 are, are, and you know, implemented in these states, I think you can start to see some of the edge come off. But um, uh, I've been at this for quite some time. I used to have to bring conservative party members from Great Britain over to meet with House members in the US because I had to say, look, he's a conservative and he's all right on this issue. What's wrong with you? And, and it just became a, uh, a, a downward spiral of partisanship. Mm -hmm. um, I do remind people that um, you know, it was only 2008 that John McCain and Barack Obama had an identical environmental policy when mm -hmm. they ran for president. And so a lot of this is changeable, uh, but the pressure that you talk about, uh, Lisa, to you know, make sure these representatives reflect your views too uh, is part of the way that game is played. I'm very conscious that uh, we've hit zero on the clock and we're now costing people <laughs> coffee time. Um, one last question. How much longer are we going to be talking about convincing the skeptics? At what point are we going to reach critical mass where there is no longer anywhere for the skeptics to hide because the, the valuation and the pricing system has just clicked in? So perhaps we'll go around and uh, each of you can give us a little prediction. Ben, let's start with you. I still think it's going to be for a while. Um, a lot of this sort of ESG data and things like that is inefficient. We're still beginning to just tell the story of where we are. Policy is still beginning. But I do think there might become a time, uh, you know, many years later, where we, we really won't have ESG analysts anymore. I think the idea is that we make that sort of title go extinct. Yeah. because it's all integrated, it's just the way that we should be thinking. And I do think we're on that path, uh, but I think we would probably be fooling ourselves to think that we're very, very far down it, given you know, the lack of that mainstream cross into where we are. But I do think that's the pathway we're sure. heading. Lisa? Yeah, I think with more leadership and more leadership that's really leading in a very proactive way, you know, we're probably a quarter of a century away from mass saturation. I don't think okay. it will happen before then. Okay. Rodrigo? Mm -hmm. I would agree. I think about 25 years is the, is the key. If you look at where the integration of ESG factors and sustainability investment practices is, it's very much on the coast, in the Northeast, and in, in some of these globe, uh, in ma major cities like Chicago and otherwise. Outside of that, you go down into other parts of, uh, of the US and they look at you with like deer staring into the headlights because they have never come across this concept, much more le much uh, less you know, when we're talking about ESG and sustainability and all these other pieces. So I think we still have a ways to go to, uh, to be able to penetrate parts uh, of, the, of uh, the country, including uh, smaller asset managers and smaller investment consultants and smaller uh, 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 plant sponsors that are setting up uh, who have real key power. So I think still think about 25 years. However, though, I will say, at the end of the day, with the more uh, availability of data, the more availability of information being put out, not only by investment managers, but also the companies themselves in their 10Ks and 10Qs and, and, uh, and the regulation SK and, and, a bunch, and the variety of other data they do put out, I think that will inevitably lead to, obviously, a, a better historical information because at the end of the day, money talks, bullshit walks. That's a good one. <laughs> I'm an optimist. You know, I think it's going to happen sooner than many of us believe that it will. I think that um, to the extent that companies demonstrate that they can have both a positive impact on the environment, human resources, and generate a positive return, um, will convince the skeptics that it's time to take that information into consideration. So I'll throw out a number and say 10 years from now, it'll be established in the DNA of the vast majority of investors and asset owners. Okay. Just a slightly different view. I think ESG specifically will, will take forever. Um, uh, I think that the standards we have for environmental uh, protection, I mean, you know, the best model we have uh, gets to a uh, zero sink uh, for oceans and land 2075. You know? 
Um, but, but we're going to have different standards by the time we get to 2075, right? It's not going to be enough that we're not polluting our environment anymore if we do everything right between now and then. We're going to want to actually put something back. Uh, water will be a bigger issue than air. Uh, who knows? But, but we'll always have these kind of social uh, changes, right? Who can say 25 years from now where we're going to believe how we should treat employees? You know, we're using it off a of standard today. Hopefully, we keep raising the bar. Hopefully, that, that these standards will change with the times, and we're constantly aspirational when it comes to things like ESG programs. Hopefully, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, there are other people sitting in the PRI conference here in San Francisco uh, uh, with uh, anxious for their coffee break uh, to say, you know, we, we've got to have better governance, you know, because it's not enough now because we've gotten all this transparency and we've gotten all this diversity and we've gotten all these, these things. Well, we're going to want more. I mean, it, the best thing about this community is we're not satisfied with where we are today, and I don't think we should ever be. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to all of you for, for taking part and sharing your views.